What an absolutely gorgeous day. It's great to see every one of you. Uh, we're, we're concluding our series on worship this morning, and the title of the message is actually called Worship Wars, Worship Wars. And a lot of times when we consider those two words together, what we think of is the kind of conflict that exists in Christianity regarding style of music or personal preferences in liturgy. And that's actually not what this is about. I have discovered over time that people tend to assume that their personal preferences are more spiritual. I've never run into a person who said, you know, I really hate that style of music, but I do think it's more spiritual, so that's, that's what I'll sing. But this is actually not about that. And we're going to look at an Old Testament story, and I know sometimes we can get a little frustrated looking back at old stories like this and wonder, are we reading something into them? What you need to know is that Scripture is not just an instruction manual with a list of rules to live by and guidelines to adhere to. That these stories are rich, they have a lot of texture to them, and they do mean multiple things. And so this morning we're going to take a look at what this story teaches us regarding worship. And before I actually get to the portion we're going to read, I'd like you to look to the back page of your notes, and we're going to look at two myths before we reveal the truths. And the first myth is this. If you do not like doing something with spiritual value, then it has little value when you do it. Sometimes we feel like when we come to church, if I don't really want to be here, maybe it's not really doing anything for me. Or when it's time to sing. I don't really feel like singing. And then we use this expression, right? Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. As though doing something you don't want to do is somehow a less significant thing. I actually don't think that that is uh, true. It's not our feeling that determines whether a prayer is answered. It's who we're talking to that determines whether a prayer is answered. That's one myth. The second myth is this. True spirituality is doing what you do not want to do in order to build up your will. Some people don't accept myth number one, and they slide to myth number two. It feels like it's polar opposite. So if I do things I really don't want to do, somehow that's strengthening my will, and that's how I please God. Uh, what I want you to know about that is that the, the goal of doing spiritual things is not to strengthen our will. It's to experience God's will. And so if we're just trying to make ourselves stronger, what's true is a lot of the challenges we face in our lives are the result of us exercising our will. So getting more of our will is not always a, a great thing. So the goal of spiritual activity is to experience God's will. Now, um, in the nation of Israel, they really struggled to maintain unity in the nation, and the, the country had actually divided into a northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And uh, the, the southern kingdom was uh, ruled at the time that we're looking at this story by a man named Jehoshaphat. It was a real name of an individual, a real king. And he received some information that's very troubling to him. Uh, the, there's reasons related to the resources that Judah had that would make them a target for enemies, and a confederation of three nations had decided to march on them with their combined military might, and the goal was to annihilate, to exterminate the nation of Judah. This just wasn't a, a, a run into a nation to try to extract some of its resources. They were going to completely eliminate it, and when, when Jehoshaphat hears this, he actually is alarmed. If You, you can find this story in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He's alarmed. He's afraid. Uh, it's amazing how many people don't like to admit their fears. Sometimes we even think that you might be more spiritual if you deny it. And what you need to know is that true spirituality is never about pretending anything. That is not helpful. So they're facing extinction, and it would be hard for us to imagine that we know what that feels like, but we do at personal levels, right? Let's suppose that you go into a doctor's office, or someone that you love goes into a doctor's office, and they receive a terminal diagnosis. They, they have a disease state that they're not going to recover from, and, and probably has condensed the remaining life into a very short period. That's, that's, an, that's a terrifying thing to consider, and it will make you afraid when you hear it. Or maybe for you, financially, just the bottom has dropped out, and you're going to lose everything. Like there's, there's no way to recover from this. You're going to lose your house. You're, you're going to lose everything. It feels like a, a kind of extinction that has come to bear. Or maybe it's a relationship, someone that you dearly love, 
uh, is now walking out or away from your life. And that relationship is now over. And there's usually language that goes along with that. Very hurtful. If you face the loss of anything you love, it will feel like an extinction of something. Something is dying and you will experience fear. Not the only emotion, but that's one of the emotions that, that you will experience that. And so that's why this story is so helpful to us because it's very easy in those moments to assume this is just a physical thing, a financial thing, an emotional thing. And so all of our responses are based on those things. And scripture actually reveals that there are physical things and financial things and emotional things, but that's not the only thing. There's a spiritual component too. And it's amazing how often we just go into the mode of reacting to the physical, financial, and emotional things, and we never consider a spiritual option. Uh, there are some people who almost assume in our culture, in our world, that if I ignore the spiritual thing, that makes me a more responsible person. Like, I'm, not, I'm not going to ignore my duties. I'm, I'm not going to use God to hide behind. Look, focusing on spiritual things doesn't make you a less responsible person. And ignoring spiritual things doesn't make you a more responsible person. So Jehoshaphat does something really interesting. Out of his fear, he decides to inquire of the Lord. And he calls not only himself and his administration, but the entire nation of Judah to prayer and to fasting. All right, now, let me just ask, how many here have heard what fasting is? Okay, how many here have ever tried to fast? How many here hate fasting? It is a terrible, terrible thing. If you don't know what fasting is, Fasting is doing without meals and meal times in order to devote your energy and your attention on God. And there are some people who just think that what this really is is a hunger strike. You just tell God, look, I'm not going to eat until I get what I want. And you should know God can outweigh you on that. He'll just look at you and go, yeah, about 45 days, we'll have another conversation. And so that... That's not what it is. It's not a hunger strike. It's not a way to manipulate God. Something else is happening. And if you've ever fasted, you know this is true. What happens in fasting is it's amazingly humbling. We have no idea how influenced we are by our regular caloric intake and how frustrated and fragile we can become when that gets interrupted. In fact, they have a whole series of commercials, right, about people who are just hungry. Well, the cultural phrase is what? Hangry. Because when, when you are hungry, you become another person. And then they give them a candy bar and all is right with the world. Don't you wish that worked? That would be nice. We just stock up on those. But what we discover is, is that we're a lot more dependent on food than we realize, and our moods and our attitudes can vary widely when we don't get... And here's the most frustrating thing. This is the thing that most frustrates me about any kind of season of fasting, and that is there are things that I assume I have mastered or outgrown. And in a season of fasting, fasting they come back. And what I discover is they were just buried that the spiritual veneer of my life is a lot thinner than I thought it was. And so fasting is incredibly humbling. And so why is that important? Because scripture reveals to us that when we humble ourselves before God, he lifts us up. It is a way of kind of recalibrating because when you, when you feel like you're in control, you can go to God and start making demands. Hey, look what I did for you. Look how faithful I've been. Look what I've done, and I deserve this. And when you are in a position of humility, you don't assume that you have a right to those things. You just start realizing it's all God's grace. It's a completely reorienting thing. And so the entire nation of Israel, or, or of Judah, begins to fast and pray, and not only does God hear their prayers, but he sends a response. He sends a response through a guy who has a long history, a multi-generational history and credentials of hearing God's word and then revealing it or releasing it in a way that's clear and compelling. And that's where I'd like us to pick up the story 
in First Chronicles or Second Chronicles 20, so you can turn back over to the front of the notes page, and this is what it says. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. And the reason that information is there is not just to fill up a page. What it's saying is this wasn't some kind of wingnut who just got excited and decided to say something. This guy has a long history of discerning what God is speaking into a situation. And he had something to say. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jurel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, let's just read this out loud and together. Ready? Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Can we do that one more time? Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. It doesn't sound much like a victory song, does it? You know? Uh, it, this is not what they, they play in stadiums of sporting events in our country. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. It tells us what happened. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off the plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing, and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder, it took three days to collect it. I think this passage reveals some important truths to us, and I, I think it will help us in some of the challenges that we face. And the first is this. True spirituality doesn't eliminate the need for courage. In fact, it calls it forth from us. The message that came from the prophet was, God's going to fight the battle for you, and the enemy will be defeated. And that sounds like amazing news until you hear the instructions. And here's the instructions. You will need to march. You will need to take your positions. You will need to face the enemy and stand up to them. Well, if God's going to win this battle for me, why do I have to do any of that? Why can't I just stay in my tent? And some people think, well, that's how you get the reward. All that plunder. And don't I don't mean to downgrade the reward, but there's a lot more going on than just getting some kind of a reward for a battle that was won on your behalf. I think there's a common misconception about spiritual life that the real reason people pursue it is to avoid life, not engage it. That somehow if you get the whole spiritual life thing right, that the rest of life just gets really easy. If you pray enough and read the Bible enough and attend rooms like this enough, that somehow the dice gets rolled in your favor and everything just kind of goes the way that you want. The problem with that model is as soon as something goes wrong in your life, you assume you got something wrong. And just the level of guilt and shame and blame that starts pouring into our hearts and minds is, is very difficult to manage. Spirituality is not about avoiding the scary things in life. Spirituality understands that there are some horrific things that have to be faced, and it calls us to face them, but not just on the basis of our own resources. 
You might be a remarkably competent person. I suspect many of you are. But I promise you, there are situations in life that are bigger and more than you have to offer. So the question is, will you only stand up and face the things that you are able to defeat on your own? Because that is going to become a limiting factor in your life. And what spirituality says is, I will be able to head in a direction and march, and I will be able to take my position, and I will be able to face my enemy and stand up to it, not because I think I am more than enough, but because I don't think I am alone that God is with me and there are resources that will help me. And this is a really important thing. So true spirituality doesn't eliminate the need for courage. It actually calls it forth from us. The second truth is this, is that worship enables us to see more than just our problems. There's, there's no shortage of people who can identify problems. You'd think it was a spiritual gift. I have people come to me all the time, Pastor, you know what the problem is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> problem finders and problem identifiers are actually quite common. It's the problem solvers that are the rare breed, and th those are the people that really help a lot. But some, this, this is what it says, right? We, we quoted the passage twice. It starts with, give thanks to the Lord. And here's the challenge, and I, and I think sometimes in, in church world we, we get pulled into this. It's the idea that our automatic cliched response when something bad happens is just to go, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> just, just, just praise the Lord. That's, that's our job. I lost my job today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> my spouse filed for divorce. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's not a good response unless maybe it is. I don't know. But <laughs> My uncle was just diagnosed with terminal cancer. Glory to God. I mean... You have to know how silly that sounds to everybody that hears it. And why do we think that that's what God demands from us? That is not what is happening here. This is not a call to just respond in a cliche way. Please understand, if spirituality is nothing more than a cliche and veneer response to the realities of life, it's going to wear you thin really fast, and you're not going to survive it. There's a lot more to this life than that, and a lot more to God than that. The horrible things are real. They are true. But they're not the only true thing. And worship enables us to see more than just the hard things and the hurtful things. Worship enables us to see that even in the midst of this, God refuses to abandon me. That God is not afraid of the dark, and he's not afraid of fire, and he's not afraid of pain. He's proven that over and over again, and as bad as it is, he will not create even an inch of separation between us and him. And that's how you can acknowledge that the Lord is good, and we can give thanks. Just look at your life. Haven't there been blessings that have shown up? Resources right when you need them. Friends at the most important time. Opportunities that open. These are all things that God has done. Why can't we just be able to acknowledge that along with the other painful truths that are part of our life? There's, there's something remarkable about being able to recognize that in spite of what I am facing right now, that that is not going to determine what Everything that I say, my voice will not be muted. There are some of us, it's, it's like our voice has been taken away. And I'm not asking you to say this is a good season. But maybe a bad situation doesn't mean that God is bad. Maybe he's going to do something in the midst of this that exceeds any expectation that you have. And then it says this, his love endures forever. The single motivating factor of God's heart is unrelenting and unwavering. He's always motivated by love. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. He is for you. But it's very easy for us to think things like this. If God really loved me, he would give me what I want. Any parents in the room? <laughs> Have you ever heard that phrase before? Any spouses in the room? You've heard that phrase before. 
If God really loved me, he'd be more sympathetic to my situation. He wouldn't allow these painful and difficult things to come into my life and to evade my life. What I can tell you is if you are a parent and all you do is give your child everything you want, everything that they want, I can tell you, you will, you will raise a spoiled child. You will actually get to the place when even you don't like them anymore. Other... <laughs> There are times when, as a parent, you, you just always want to take your child's side, even when they've done something they shouldn't have done. We just go to war for them. And the challenge is, is, is what can they learn when you keep telling them that what they did was okay? You can try to protect your child from any pain. You're not going to play any sport because you might get injured. I don't want you trying out for a school that's too demanding because you might not succeed. I don't want you to be hurt by someone who walks out of your life, so we're going to make sure you don't have friends that are that significant in your life. And here's what you need to know. In a desire to keep your child from experiencing any pain, you will isolate them in a way that will completely hamstring them from ever becoming anything God intended for their life or you ever wanted for their life. It just doesn't work. And, and I know, you know, the child might look at you and, and, and say, you don't love me. And a parent understands that that is an emotion the child is feeling, but it's based on an immature understanding. And how often we do this to God. He doesn't feel like he's taking our side. It doesn't feel like he's protecting us from a painful situation. He's not giving us exactly what we want. And we just start questioning his love. But the longer you walk with him, the more you discover he really does love you. The third truth is this, is that worship empowers us to discern God's prompting and to act on it. And I think this might be the more challenging thing for some of us to hear today. I think there might be some people in the room today who are afraid to hear what God might speak to you. Maybe we don't want to be challenged. Maybe we don't want to be given direction. Maybe we don't want to be disappointed. We've gotten our hopes up before. And we wonder how many of those disappointments we can manage and still maintain some kind of existence. Maybe you're so afraid of being hurt again, you are willing to endure the pain of isolation and loneliness rather than the pain of someone walking out of your life. Maybe you're so afraid of losing something or someone that you will tolerate things that should not be tolerated. And what I have to say to you today is that God wants to speak to you. But he's not going to scream from heaven and drive us to the, our knees. He's going to interrupt our thoughts and he's going to whisper a prompting to our heart and we get to decide what we're going to do about that. This is why I think worship is so important. It's not just what we're saying to God about God. It helps us see more than the problem that we're dealing with. And it sensitizes us to hear something back from him. And so this morning... We're going to do something together. This is how we're going to conclude our service today. In just a minute, we're all going to stand, and I'm going to ask us to, to sing out in worship. And maybe you're here and you go, yeah, I, I don't do that. Okay. Uh, I'm not really into peer pressure. I'm not going to single you out. And we're... <laughs> I was in a service like this once where we're just going to keep singing this song until everybody sings it. That is, that is a bad idea. If, if you have to be peer pressured into, manipulated, or intimidated into something, um, life's not going to go well for you at a lot of levels. We just have to decide.
And I'm not asking you to feel anything. Well, I don't feel worthy. Well, I've got news for all of us, we're not. Well, I don't feel motivated. Yeah, if, if you're a parent, there's lots of things you've done for your kids you didn't feel like doing. If you work a job, there's lots of days you showed up, you'd rather stay home. It's not about any of those things. It's about embracing a concept that just maybe there's more to this life than a physical thing, an emotional thing, and a financial thing. That just maybe there's something as real or more real than all of that. And that my running away from it or ignoring it doesn't benefit my life or anybody around me. And that if there is a God and he had something to say, would I not want to hear what that is? So I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And we're going to lift our voice. And once again, no pressure. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But our goal in lifting our voice is to declare a thing that's true about God, but then we're going to take about 30 seconds, and I'll guide us through this part of the exercise when we get there, to hear from God. What if he had something to say to you today? Wouldn't you like to know what that is? Wouldn't you like to know? So Ben's going to lead us in this portion of the song. Come on, let's sing Your Name is a Light. Just the voices and the acoustic guitar this morning. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive. It's forever lifted I. Your name cannot be overcome. Let's push back the darkness. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. In his name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted I. Your name cannot be overcome. I say, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, and we sing, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. So I'm, I'm going to ask that we just bow our heads and close our eyes. And please understand that's not because I think that's somehow a, a more spiritual position. The goal right now is just to eliminate distraction. And uh, I would like you to be open to uh, an interrupting thought or a prompting from heaven that would give you a sense of direction that there's, just like the word came to Jehoshaphat, this is where you're to march to. This is the direction you're to aim at. This is the place to, to go towards. I'm wondering if God has a sense of direction for you today. And then the second part, take your position. How should you position yourself? What would God like you to do? Because please understand this. Moving in a direction and positioning yourself is not just about a reward you can get from it, but about something God is doing in you. Something's getting stronger when you do that. 
when you face the thing you're afraid of, when you stand up to it, say, well, how do I know it'll work out? I can't promise that I will, but I can promise that if you follow the directions of God, something inside of you gets stronger and healthier, and that is the most significant thing that can happen in your life. So we're going to take just about 30 seconds. Is there a direction? Is there a position? Is there something I need to face that I've been running from? Just see what heaven whispers to your heart. Father, we're open to hearing from you. We're not trying to establish the grounds on which you speak to us. We're not trying to determine an outcome ahead of time. We trust that you are good. We choose to be thankful for the benefits we've experienced in our life. And we believe that your love doesn't have an expiration date. When the sun rises tomorrow, you will still love us. Help each and every one of us today that gained any sense of understanding and direction or how to position ourselves or what to face, the courage to follow through because you have not come to make life easy for us. You have come to make us brave. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Uh, this is the portion of the service where we actually receive tithes and offerings. And, and I know that can be a scary thing to let something go when you feel like you need more of it. But I think we have to decide whether we're going to be the kind of people who position ourselves always to get or are we willing to be the kind of person who will give. I'm always apprehensive whenever I talk about things like this because there can be an assumption. Well, of course the pastor wants people to give more money, that's how he gets a bigger income. Uh, my income will not be affected by anything related to an offering we receive here. What's true about us is that we don't have unlimited resources. I'm not aware of any billionaires in the room, and if you're here and I don't know it, I would like to see you right after the service, because. <laughs> We got a building project going. It's, it's not about waiting until I have too much to know what to do with. It's about being willing to trust God with what I have. That's the difference. And if we're willing to position ourselves as a, a giver, a generous person, well, it's amazing what God does in us and through us. So, Father, um, help us face our fears of not having enough and trust that you are at work even in what we are able to let go of. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>